Hey, Fed Heads. Welcome to another episode of Sharing Our Pairings, episode 25, Japanese Whiskey, or as I like to call it, man, we've been drinking a lot of beer lately. I'm your host, John the Cigar Surgeon, here live on CigarFederation.com, sponsored by me because it's come out of my pocket, and that's the way I like it. Um, thanks very much to our listeners. Appreciate our podcast listeners. Appreciate everyone listening live. And uh, if you haven't already, please download the Cigar Federation app. We're going to plug it right up front because there's a heck of a giveaway going. You can win a chance to go on the Drew Estate Cigar Safari. Uh, all you need to do is check out the show page, download the app. It's available for iTunes and for Android. I'm with my co-host, Robbie Rass. Rob. That, that was a hell of an intro, man. Thanks, brother. You uh you nailed this this actually this show is 100% sponsored by you, um so I and I appreciate the uh, the whiskeys that you uh, you picked up and shared with me, um I'm excited I did buy my cigar I'll 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 go that far I I paid for my own cigar but beyond that this show is definitely sponsored by you and definitely download that uh, uh download the app it's all available and updated and everything and it's all that cool business. But if you go to the uh, Cigar Federation uh, Facebook page, you can see the, the way to intro yourself into the contest. So you have to download the app to get an intro, and then this will all happen this weekend. So uh, definitely worth doing. That's on the Cigar Federation-specific trip. I, mean, I think we've only got – this is, I think, our last spot that we're giving away. I think. Yeah, I think it's the last spot of the year. Yeah. So uh, – and hopefully this uh, Cigar uh, Federation safari trip becomes an annual thing, but – um, at this point, we don't really know, but uh, it's it's sold out, so there you go. Um, other than that, life's great, man. It's it's like 85 degrees, and uh, we've got four Japanese whiskeys. I've got a Casada 40th Anniversary Corona Classico that is just a fantastic cigar. If you haven't smoked this yet, I, I'd i slap you if you were here. Because <laughs> it's, it, it's, it, it's, it's, it's quite simply one of the best uh, cigars available on the market right now, in my opinion. Um, I am uh, smoking the uh, Arturo Fuente Double Chateau Fuente from the Extremely Rare Holiday Collection, and this is the 2012. So this shows you, like, I have way too many cigars, or I'm doing... Logan's got me grinding the grindstone, putting my nose to the grindstone too much, because I mean, I mean this, this is, I think, the second cigar I've cracked from my 2012 holiday collection. It's 2015, bro. It's 2015. <laughs> what is going on? You you like them to, to, to get a little rest and get a little nap in. There's nothing wrong with that. Pardon my uh, my lighter in the background, by the way. I was no worries, brother. Uh, as usual, um, behind schedule and you know. So there you go. So uh, quick uh, quick hit on the Arturo Fuente Double Chateau Fuente, made in the Dominican Republic, uh, which is kind of what I was aiming for for this show. We're looking for a little bit more. Uh, subtle cigar for this pairing. Uh, comes in a nice cedar sleeve and the green band because you have to guess at what Arturo Fuente you are smoking, which is kind of frustrating. Nothing. It is uh, <laughs> six and three quarter inches by 50 ring gauge. has the Connecticut shade wrapper. You can see that it's that nice golden brown wrapper, Dominican filler. Retails for about somewhere between six and eight bucks. Um, it's, a, it's a mild medium cigar. Um, I mean, this would be fantastic with coffee, tea, and Japanese whiskey, which is what we're talking about tonight. Yeah, um, I'm. Uh, you know, I'm actually not prepared to give you guys any uh, background on the cigar. Um, I can just start talking about Japanese whiskey if you want. <laughs> <know. laughs> no, I, I am. I'm in the process of looking it up, but um, you know, I actually didn't. Um, I know somebody reviewed it on the site, but it wasn't me. Oh yeah, I think, I think, I think it was the, It was the big tuna. Oh, big tuna. And it's actually the Corona Classica. I always, I've been calling it the Corona Classico since I started smoking it. And I've been wrong this whole damn time. And, you know, I'm glad that I went out of my way to pull up some information for you because there is a plethora of it here. Um, it is a Lonsdale Extra. So it's a 6.5 by 46. Most Lonsdale nice pieces. 6 by 46. So 6.5 give you that nice extra half inch. Um, <clears throat> That's what she said. Yeah, indeed. Um... Wrapper, binder, and filler are um, from a country that I've never heard of. It's, it's like shaped like a little question mark. Um, nothing's been disclosed on this, really. I think at one point um, we were talking about it and kind of accidentally found out that it has uh, an Ecuadorian um, Connecticut wrapper on it, but I'm not 100% positive. Interesting. So there's no information, but it tastes 
great. Those nice. Casadas pair really well too. Yeah, they do, and uh, well, a lot of them are are built that way. You know, we've talked about this in the past, but um, yeah, a, a lot of the Casadas do pair quite nicely. This one, um, I've smoked my share of these, and I've uh, they're actually uh, back on the market. They were gone for a while, and I, I started to get a little scared that I didn't purchase enough of them. They're not cheap; it's like a ten dollar cigar, but um, <clears throat> definitely worth checking out if you can uh, if you can get your hands on a few. Um, nice smooth profile, full flavor, medium strength, um, just a ton of flavor to it. It's it's really just a great cigar. Cool, cool. So um, as the show title says, we are talking about Japanese whiskey. We didn't have a ton of questions for the show, so I'm just going to talk and talk and talk, and we're just going to talk about whiskey, and that's what we're going to do tonight. Um, as, as you know, I'm a huge scotch slut. I'm like a huge scotch slut. I have a huge cabinet full of scotch. I love it. I love scotch, scotchy, scotchy, scotch. Japanese whiskey is really intended to emulate scotch. Now, if you followed our previous shows, and I know you have, because we've got our back catalogs on our Cigar Federation website, and I know you're already subscribing to our YouTube channel, so you've seen our previous scotch shows. But just in case you haven't, all scotch is whiskey, but not all whiskey is scotch. So... In order for it to be called scotch, it has to follow a pretty strict guideline of, of rules, and the most important of which is it has to come from Scotland. Just like if you want to call something bourbon, bourbon has to come from the United States. So this is Japanese whiskey produced in a very, very Scottish style. And that's, it, you know, if a lot of people out there follow Japanese culture, they're kind of like me a little bit, or I should say I'm kind of like them would be more appropriate, very obsessive. They, they have a particular interest or a particular hobby, and they become very, very obsessive, and this is very true of Japanese whiskey. Uh, it might surprise a lot of listeners out there to find that Japanese whiskey actually goes back to the, the late 1800s, so 1870. Oh. This, yeah, and this is really, uh, I mean, you look at a lot of distilleries in Scotland, there's a lot of distillers that weren't even around in 1870. I mean, there were a lot of distilleries, but um, there's a ton of distilleries that didn't open until the late 1880s, 1890s, even the early 1900s. So, you know, by its own right, uh, it goes back a fair ways. Now, commercial production didn't actually start until 1924, but, I mean, they are working on whiskey a long time ago. Uh, whiskey in Japan was founded by Sinjiro Tori, and I'm sure my pronunciation is terrible. Uh, he hired Masataka Taka, Takatsuru, and we're going to talk a little bit about these two guys because... Uh, there's a little bit of rivalry going between their two companies, and we'll talk about that as we go on. Um, Masataka Takatsuru was the distillery executive. Um, this is the guy that went to Japan, or, um, sorry, um, uh, went to uh, Scotland, uh, studied under Scottish masters. Um, he, he studied organic chemistry at the University of Glasgow, uh, went to Hazelburn, which was open in, in uh, I think it was open in Glasgow at that time, uh, studied whiskey production and brought those techniques back to J Japan. Um, and this guy uh, was literally taking measurements of the floors and the height of the building and the size of their whiskey room. And, like, like he had a notepad. He was taking every, like, what kind of shoes the guys are wearing. I mean, you talk about obsessive. They were really committed to reproducing Scottish whiskey in Japan at a time where there wasn't really an appetite for whiskey in Japan. Um, so uh, so he, he brought the knowledge back. They opened their first commercial distillery in 1924, which is, uh, as you know today, Yamazaki, and we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, now, sort of some of the, the separation here where you get into some of the rivalries is he actually left um, and joined Kotobukaya, which is now, as you know, as Beam Suntory or Suntory, and formed the first distillery, which is uh, Yamazaki. Um, or, uh, sorry, let me try this again. Uh, they formed the first distillery, Yamazaki, in 1923. Uh, then he left in 1934, and f and I'm not I'm going to try and pronounce this. This is going to be terrible. Dinapanakaju, and we know that today is Nika. Much easier to say. <laughs> I, I can say Nika, that's no problem. Um, and then he went on to form the Yoshi Distillery in Hokkaido. Yoshi is, uh, is, is owned by the Nika Distillery Company. Um, Japanese whiskey making is, uh, started out as a very traditional Scottish style, but I think where it's evolved, and we'll, again, we'll kind of talk about it as we go on our, our whiskeys today, and I'll stop talking eventually. 
they're really innovative. They, they do a lot of things that are innovative for the whiskey industry. They use new technology. They're not afraid to try different yeast strains, uh, different wood uh, different wood types, we'll talk about that, blending strategy, strategies. Um, and then the last thing I'll talk about, and we'll, we'll start talking about the whiskeys, and I'll let you get a word in edgewise because I'm super excited about Japanese whiskey. The big thing about Japanese whiskey, and this is where the, the sort of rivalry comes in, they do not really trade spirit. In Scotland, if you run a distillery, you're probably going to trade spirit between a company, and so this is an unaged uh, spirit because you only have one style of, of, uh, of still. You can only produce one type of spirit. So if you're, you're, most companies will, will take multiple types of spirits and age them. They don't take one kind of spirit necessarily in most of the cases. So in Japan, there's no trading. Nikka and uh, Beam Suntory do not trade. They are rivals. They are rivals in like the uh, Wild West style gun guns at noon, uh, rivalry goes. Like, yeah, they do not get along. So that's my that's my quick spiel. I'm, I was very excited to talk about Japanese whiskey, as you can tell. No, that's, you know, it's, I was just thinking, like, <clears throat> you do so much research, and you prepare so much for this show, and I don't do a damn thing. And sometimes I feel guilty about that, but uh, a lot of the time it's like I feel like I'm sitting in on a class that you're teaching. Because <laughs> that was, I, you know, I didn't, I didn't know anything about Japanese whiskey until maybe like two or three years ago when <clears throat> my wife and I were at this uh, restaurant bar that we like to go to occasionally, and um, the, uh, the bartender there is actually from Nicaragua. And so this, was, this must have been 2013 when I uh, first met him because that was when I was going down on Cigar Safari, and I was telling him about that. He got all excited. Uh, and he keeps telling me that he has some cigars for me, but uh, I go in there, we go in there like once or twice a year, and every time, this guy must make so much money, because he always remembers my name. He's got to be the best bartender in the world. He remembers everybody, and uh, he always gets fat tips, but um, <clears throat> we were doing all kinds of, of whiskey tasting and bourbon tasting and scotch, and he says, have you ever ta tasted any Japanese whiskey? I said, no, I've never even heard of it, so he brought down uh, a couple of things, Hibiki and uh, Yamazaki, I think, were the main ones that he had. And I tasted those. That was the first time I'd ever heard of it. And you, you're telling me that it's been around for 150 years. Yeah. <clears throat> so that's, I had no idea. I always learn something on this show, whether it's by trial and error or uh, one of your lectures. <laughs> well, now, one thing I just want to say, because uh, I don't, I don't want to come off as a know-it-all, a lot of this is, um, I, know I, I know a little bit about scotch, I know a little bit about Japanese whiskey. Most of what I learned about Japanese whiskey is actually from Andrew Ferguson, who does uh, tastings here in Calgary at uh, Kensington Wine Market. I've talked about Kensington Wine Market in the past. He's been on the show. Uh, he has been to Japan. He's been to several of these distilleries. I've been to three of his Japanese whiskey tastings. They're always fascinating. He's got photos from the stills or from the uh, distilleries. Um, he talks about some of the history behind the the um, companies. And then, of course, as I mentioned at the start of the show, uh, well, maybe actually, I think it was before the show started. I think I sat down for like two hours, because really, um, the history behind some of these distilleries is really quite fascinating. Some of the um, technical details behind the way they make uh, whiskey is really interesting, at least to me. Um, but we'll talk about maybe that a little bit as we go in. And we'll start with our first whiskey, uh, which is the Nikka. I'm just going to hold it up because I didn't give you the full bottle because I'm such a bastard. <laughs> so this is the Nikki, Nikka Coffee Malt. Now, you're looking at that and you're like, well, first of all, they've misspelled coffee. So number one, they've misspelled coffee. Those crazy Japanese... Um, and if you look there, you'll see it's 45%. So it's a heater. Yeah. It has some heat to it. Uh, but right off the start, I just want to say coffee, it is not coffee in the sense of brewing coffee. Coffee is a guy from Scotland. He was a, um, a customs officer, and he perfected the column still. Now, the column still is used in whiskey production, not specifically scotch, scotch malted scotch production, but whiskey production. So um, he found a way to make a, a column still that is just superb for whiskey, and uh, Nika took these column stills and moved them over to their, to their factories, their distilleries in Japan. So when you see coffee, C-O-F-F-E-Y, that's the actual name of a, of a Scottish dude. 
Um, so I'm just going to hold it up for audience here. You can see it. I mean, it's got some color to it, and color uh, in a lot of cases for whiskeys and, and scotches um, can tell you a little bit about the whiskey, but there's a, there is a, there's a thing, at least in scotch whiskey, where they can add uh, coloring, which is unfortunate, um, partially because people kind of, you know, they buy a brand and they want a specific, specific style or look to that that they're used to. As far as I know, this is not colored. Um, now, it's got some really nice legs to it, so if you, if you kind of pour or turn it in the glass, you can see that um, it's got some nice droplets, and that tells you a little bit about the whiskey. Now, this is... Um, uh, this is a blended no age statement whiskey. So what that means is they've taken Nika because they do not trade. They've taken some of their own whiskey. Um, now this is malted whiskey. So this is not grain whiskey. This is actual malted whiskey, barley, malted barley. Um, and they blended it, they blended it together. So the average age of the whiskey that has gone into this is 10 years. How, like now, the thing with with Scotch blends is that it could be a uh, 21 year old and a 5 year old it could be a uh, 25 year old and a 20 year old you really don't know and they're really not going to tell you because they're looking for a particular flavor profile um, now I'm just kind of yammering on because I'm very excited about whiskey but um, I'm going to give it a nose while you chat for a little bit so the, the age statement is different than in uh, than we've talked about in the past right like with with bourbons the age statement is the if it's a 10 year old bourbon that means at, at least every bourbon that's used or that, that it's mixed with or whatever is 10 years old, correct? Mm -hmm. Now, in general with bourbon, and there are some exceptions, but when you see an 8-year-old bourbon, it's an 8-year-old bourbon. They've aged it for 8 years, they put it into a bottle, that's it. When you see an 8-year-old scotch or a 12-year-old scotch or a 15-year-old scotch, that means that the minimum age... Okay, so a scotch we were talking about, yeah. Yeah. So the minimum age of scotch that's in that bottle is that year. That doesn't mean that the, that's the maximum age. It just means the minimum age. So when you see a 12, it could have some 21 in there. It could have some 17 in there. But by law, at least Scottish law, the minimum age whiskey in there is the one that's on the bottle. So for But for the Japanese whiskey, it's the average, you said. Hmm. No, in this case, this is a no-age statement, so there is no age. We don't know what the – there is no age. They've not assigned an age to this. Um, but doing some research, some of the sort of smarter technical people that are online, and I got this from uh, Japanese, Japanese-whiskey.com, Japanese which is a really cool site. Check it out. They say that the average age of the uh, single malts that went into this is roughly 10 years. Okay, I misunderstood what you were saying. Sorry about that. No, 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 it was – I just – I misunderstood. So – Okay, so scratch all that that I just said. And uh, I know John's taking the nose on this. And I, I went around and I was <clears throat> taking, uh, just taking in the nose on all of these and in my fancy pants, Glen Karen glasses. Yeah, I'm lifting my pinky while I hold it. Glen Karen. Um, but just to tell you how great of a guy John is, the cigar surgeon, this is, he, he sent me these little bottles, which are what? 50, 50 mils. mils. Yeah. And... And it was, I mean, we're just, just for the show, which, I mean, this is probably more than I needed to pour. And as you can see, that's still half full. And I like to hold these bottles because I feel like a giant sometimes. But, uh, yeah, huge. This, I mean, there's so much, there is so much Japanese whiskey here for me to drink <laughs> that I, I'm, I'm really, I really am appreciative. And, uh, when we, <clears throat> when we do it up in New Orleans for, uh, for IPCPR, you won't be buying too many drinks. Um, that's very nice of you. But the one thing that I noticed about this, the nose on it is very distinct mm -hmm. uh, in comparison to the other three. Yep. And it, the, the main thing that I get, there's a sour note that's on the nose, and it reminds me of that smell of fresh cut wood. Yep. When it, if someone's taken, uh, you've got like a table saw, and you're running, and it's, you know, yep. it screams through there. You know that smell that you get? Mm -hmm. not, the, not the burnt smell of it, but if you smell the wood right after, that's what I'm smelling. That It's that big, it's a sour note. It's it's almost like um it's it's almost a bourbony like a sour mash corn mash that you'd get out of bourbon. <clears throat> yeah, and maybe it's just I'm not used to these glasses. I've had these Glen Cairn glasses. They were on the top shelf in my kitchen, and uh, out of some weird form of luck, I had four of them, and we're doing right. four uh, tastings tonight. Um, so this is the first time I've used all of them. Two of them are still in their original box. I had to wash them. Um, so I don't know if that I, I assume that that impacts the uh, <clears throat> the nose that you're going to get on them, but I I can't. I can't recall ever getting a nose like this off of any other whiskey that I've had. 
Now, one thing we're going to do is when we go along, we're not going to we're not going to finish the whole. And I love finishing whiskey, but we're we're going to leave a little bit in the glass. And this is kind of a technique that I've learned from um, some of the great whiskey uh, people that I put on shows. And what's going to happen is we're going to go through all four, and you're going to come back. And, and you're going to get a ton of flavor and a ton of nose off this whiskey that you're not getting right now. It's very weird, but it's almost like your palate and your, and your nose um, needs to get accustomed to it. And when you come back, there's going to be a, a, just a ton of flavors, a whole cavalcade of flavors that you're not getting right now. And it's, it, it's, it's kind of weird because, you know, you hear people talk about whiskey and you're like, yeah, yeah, uh, vanilla and, and caramel and toffee and blah, blah, blah. It's like, yeah, okay. Like it's it's whiskey, man. I don't get any of that. <laughs> and then you go back and you're like, holy crap! Like that's like fresh baked chocolate with like cinnamon bun and cream cheese. And you're like, oh my god! Like I, like I really get that. And you do. So leave a little bit in the glass as we go through it. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm getting a little bit of pear, which is kind of interesting for me. I, I love that you said the word cavalcade. By the cavalcade. way, cavalcade. It's a good word. Thank and you. Before I jump into this, and we've got four, so I'm going to stop BSing. But look at the burn. That is perfect. I mean, that is that is spot on. It just doesn't really get better than that. These these cigars are so damn good. Um. Anyway, uh, so I'm going to go and jump into this first one here. So while you're doing that, a little bit about NICA. Uh, they are the second largest dis uh, distillery company, distillery operator in Japan. They own Yoshi Distillery, Miyagikyo. Uh, Sendai, Miyagi Prefecture, Honsu, and then they also have bought out a Scotch um, distillery in Scotland, Ben Nevis. So they're huge. Um, as I talked about at the start of the show, the top of the show, uh, founded by Masataka Takatsuru, who uh, was the guy that really you know, studied and brought Scotch whiskey to Japan, um, studied organic chemistry, uh, did his, his whiskey understudy at Hazelburn. Um, his son is now taken over because, of course, this is you know 130 years ago. His son, te, te, or adopted son te, Takeshi Takatsuru, has taken over the the, the ownership, so he owns the company. Um, Nikka Coffee Malt is specifically distilled at the Miyagikyo uh, facility. Um, the stills that they use were brought over from Scotland. So imagine they took these huge, huge stills, threw them on the boat in 1963 brought them over to Miyagikyo, so these coffee stills, huge, huge things, um, and brought them over. Um, and it's 45% alcohol. Now, you've taken a taste already. Um, how, do you, how do you find that first couple sips? They're pretty hot. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little bit hot. I mean, um, I, this is the, the, the first alcohol I've had today. It's only 5.25 in the afternoon for me, so uh, it's 5 o'clock somewhere, right? Yeah. Um, I want to take a few more sips before I comment on it. Um, it, it is, it's a unique flavor for me, and it's tough because I've already started the cigar, and it feels like we're doing more of a Japanese whiskey tasting as opposed to a pairing so far, but, <laughs> uh, but I'm okay with that because I don't know anything about it, and it's, uh, I, I'm interested to learn. But I, I do want to take a couple more uh, pulls off of this before I talk about flavors. So what I'm getting off my cigar is I'm getting a lot of uh, nuttiness, which I was hoping for, um, like a like a ground nuttiness. So it's a nice thick nutty taste. A um, little bit of hay. Um, very very typical what I get off a Connecticut wrapper, uh, and and a very similar profile. This is, like I would say Arturo Fuente is is probably an, the most perfect representation of a Dominican blend. Like it's just it's a nice smooth balanced Dominican cigar that's not going to blow out your palate. It's not peppery. Um, you know, it's, it is complex, but it's not full-bodied in the sense that it's not going to blow you away with, with, with strength. Um, and when we talk about these, these whiskeys we're doing today, they are delicate, um, which is unusual because normally when you have an Irish whiskey, what, you know, people talk about Irish whiskeys or whiskey, they're looking for something very smooth, very easy drinking. And what we're looking for is that, that character but also flavor complexity. So what the way I was going with that is sort of the same thing that you're getting out of a Dominican cigar. Very easy to smoke, but that doesn't mean it's not complex. So easy to smoke, complexity, same with Japanese whiskey. Easy to drink, but it has a lot of complexity to it. Just a reminder to our audience that you're listening to Sharing Our Pairings, episode 25, Japanese Whiskey, hosted by CigarFederation.com, sponsored by Rob and the Cigar Surgeon. 
whether you're listening on a podcast, whether you're listening on our YouTube, or whether you're listening on the Cigar Federation app, which you should download immediately from iTunes or Android Play Store. We appreciate you guys tuning in, and appreciate you giving our questions on the Q&A app. So uh, a couple more sips. How's that uh, treating you? You know, with the, the pairing between the two, uh, what I'm getting from this, this whiskey is like a doughy kind of sweetness. Yep. And I don't know if that makes sense. And I, I don't... Um, my wife made this dessert thing last night, and I don't even—I couldn't even tell you what it was called. But it was like a—it <clears throat> was like a cakey kind of thing that she did in a ramekin that had strawberries in it, and it was fantastic. But the dough almost had like a pancakey kind of flavor to it, mm-hmm. and that's what I'm getting from this. Yep. And the—and that really goes with what I get from the cigar. The cigar has got some of that baking spice to it. It's not going to overpower you with the spice. Um, it's got kind of a, a creamy texture to it, a creamy sweetness to it, and the two are, are really melding really well. So to be completely honest, it's hard for me to tell what I'm getting from the whiskey and what I'm getting from the cigar, but yep. the, the main, and I, in a way I think that's kind of a good thing, um, the main thing that I'm getting from, uh, that I feel like I'm getting from this whiskey though, is a doughy, uh, a doughy flavor that's got a little bit of sweetness to it, um, real dry on the finish, yep. which I like, um, and that I don't get any of that. I, I expected to get some sour notes out of it, but I'm not. I, I get that in the nose, but definitely not on the tongue. And uh, just a little word about the Glencairn glasses. I mean, one of the big advantages of the Glencairn glass, and I'd, I'd strongly recommend to anybody out there drinking whiskey, uh, get a Copita glass or get a Glencairn glass. Um, I know it sounds hipster, but it will change your life when you're when you're tasting whiskey because when you drink it, your nose is getting right in there, and your nose is a very integral part of the whiskey experience. Your nose is giving you lots, feeding you lots of information about that whiskey. Um, and, he, you know, if you haven't already, buy a single glass, do a blind tasting of yourself of a whiskey that you or scotch that you like on a regular basis, try it with the Glencairn. I guarantee you that you will like it more with the Glencairn. You'll get a lot more out of it. Yeah, you know, like like I said, I, I do have, <clears throat> obviously I've got four of these. Uh, I think my wife got me a couple, um, and then my mother-in-law got me a couple for Christmas. And I, I rarely ever use them um, because I like to break... Uh, the fourth rule, and I, I do like to have some ice in there. Um, and I know that, that upsets John a little bit, but um, if it, I, I, I try to go with the larger ice cubes, the, the big round ones that don't, that don't, uh, that don't melt quite as quickly. Um, and I, f- I feel like that does twofold for me. I like to put a little splash of water in things if I'm drinking them uh, without ice. Uh, for the most part, not everything. Um, I feel like that opens up the flavors a little bit. But uh, I, I like to have everything cold too. Um, but the, the glasses are great, and I, I need to use them more often. I'm having so, a hard time. I'm having a hard time. Sorry, explaining the flavors that I'm getting out of this. It, it's it's coating the tongue, and they're really cigar-like flavors. So I, I'm inclined to say that it's I'm getting most of it from the cigar. But it's almost like a that that creamy kind of cedar type flavor with a little bit of Cinnamon spice, baking spice in there, and a little bit of sweetness is what is the main thing that I'm getting out of this. Yep. And I really like well, it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the Nick of Coffee Malt is not very expensive. Um, it's very, very easy drinking. It pairs with a lot of stuff. I mean, I've paired it with just an absolute ton of stuff, bourbon, whiskey, whatever. Um, uh, you know, it's good. It's it's just it's tasty stuff. You can you can have it uh, with cigars. You can have it with other stuff. You can put ice in it if you want. the The downside of putting ice in a whiskey is that um, it does change the uh, it does change the uh, proteins, the esters that are in the alcohol. Um, and the problem is it it does dull your tongue a little bit. So, um, you know, we're not we're not tasting hipsters. It's your drink. Have it the way you like it. The most important thing is that you enjoy it and um, I don't want to be that guy preaching to you. Um, my only recommendation would be try it without ice and then try it with ice. And you're going to find that you're going to get a lot more uh, comp- complexity of flavor out of it without ice. One thing I will say, um, and Bob Dog is in the chat room giving me a hard time about using ice. Um, <clears throat> for the most part, when I'm sipping on a bourbon or a whiskey or a scotch at home, um, it's usually uh, nothing too fancy. Um, I do have a few things that I that are, are fancy for me, 
Um, Stranahan's, uh, for example, is uh, is something that's that's fancy for me. It's about a seventy dollar bottle. It's not gonna blow not gonna blow you out, but you can't really get it everywhere. It was it was given to me as a gift, and so when I when I sip that, I do sip that without ice in it. Um, I've got a an Arbalor, Abalor, Arbalor, Abalor, yeah. Uh, Sixteen year old that was a, a a Christmas gift that I really enjoy, and I do that so without tasty. ice. Yeah, that's that's great stuff. So uh, as I climb the ladder of uh, <laughs> and really, I'm just basing this on price. Uh, when I cl- as I climb that ladder, I'm less inclined to use ice. Um, but I, I, th- this is we're getting off topic, I think, and I, I'm I'm assisting in that because um, at some point I want to talk to you about things like whiskey stones and stuff like that, which I know we've touched on. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe, maybe this isn't the right time for that, but anyway, I think we're probably ready to move on to our second. Yep. So we're going to talk about the second whiskey, and uh, before we get into that, I'll talk a little bit about why Japanese whiskey is so unique. And uh, one of the big reasons is if you're running a distillery in Japan, you're probably running one or two types of stills. And when I say types, what I mean is a particular shape of still. And the shape of your still determines the quality of your spirit. And by quality, I mean the the flavor complexity, the flavor quality. So the reason there's so much trading, and I talked about that between the different distillers, is because you can only produce one type or style of spirit, or maybe two. Uh, I think it's pretty standard for most distilleries to only have two types of pot stills. Pot stills is the very typical type of still you'll find in a distillery. So they rely on trade. Because the Japanese distilleries do not, you go into these Japanese distilleries, you might find 12 different kinds of pot stills or column stills or coffee stills or whatever, uh, which is crazy. I mean, that like you think about the combination of spirit they're producing and then the, the number of flavor combinations and the amount of different blends you can make out of that. And I mean, you know, you're talking at, uh, an exponentially larger combination of of flavors that you can get. And then you add into that the fact that they're um, doing different yeast strains and they're doing different woods, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, You're getting a product that is unique. And unique is a word that gets tossed around a lot, but truly unique. There's nobody else in the world that's doing this. Um, and, And I applaud them for sort of taking a very traditional industry and moving it along. You're not going to see the scotch industry doing this. They're very traditional. And, you know, I have a cabinet full of scotch. I love scotch. But... Uh, they're not innovating in the sense that they're not changing a 200, 250-year-old tradition. Um, the Japanese are. So, uh, second whiskey is from Hakushu Distillery. Uh, again, this is under the this Beam Suntory. So we're we're going from Nikka to Beam Suntory. So the the opposite companies here. Um, established in 1973, so they're fairly new. Uh, they're opened on the uh, side of Mount Kakaimo, which is this huge, huge mountain in Japan. Um, in 1981, they opened a second facility. They called it um, uh, Hakushu East, and then they moved all the facility productions there and renamed the original distillery location uh, Hakushu West. But only East is now up and running. Uh, if you see pictures of this, and I definitely recommend Googling the Hakushu distillery because it's gorgeous. It's in like this amazing valley with just surrounded by a canopy, huge canopy of trees uh, uh, and with this huge mountain range around it. Um, it's amazing. Um, it's it's uh, situated right next to the town of Hakusha, which is where it gets its name. Um, today we're going to be drinking the Hakushu 12. Um, and you can see it's kind of got a green bottle, and there's a reason for that. Um, it's kind of, you know, it's cool, slick, stands out. Um, what's interesting about them and the style of whiskey they produce is that they import their malted barley from Scotland. So they, they actually put it on a boat, import malted, uh, malted barley from Scotland. Um, one of the big things, and again, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but the most important thing in whiskey production, number one, is water source. Uh, you talk to anyone in the Scotch whiskey industry, they'll tell you that water source is the very most important thing. Um, they formed this distillery specifically because of the Ojara River, which is a granite water source. So the water gets filtered through this natural uh, granite, which produces just a crystal clean water, um, and that makes it perfect. The other interesting thing about this distillery 
is it's got an absurd elevation. They're sitting at 700 meters, or in freedom units, it's 2,300 feet. 2,300 feet. For comparison, the average distillery in Scotland is only at uh, 355 meters, which is 1,100 feet, 1,164 feet. So literally double, um, you know, double in a, a bit dis, uh, elevation. Um, what that does for you is that your uh, your spirit actually ages slower in the barrel. Uh, as a result of aging slower in the barrel, um, it gets less wood influence. So you can kind of play around with the types of wood you use. Um, uh, I, I held up the bottle, but the uh, Hakushu is 43%, so we're still in that you know above 40% category, mid 40s. Um, and it's a combination of three different types of spirits. So they take their spirit and they put it in a hogshead barrel, um, which is a, uh, a American oak. They put it in a, and this is an unpeated malt, so no peat added, no peat used in the uh, malting, the the malting of that barley. Uh, they take unpeated mar, mar, unpeated malt and they put it in a sherry butt. So this is a Spanish sherry, um, which gives it this nice sweetness. And then last but not least, they actually take the peated malt. So this is peated malt from Scotland, and they put it in ex bourbon casks. And then they take all three of these spirits after they've aged, and they blend them together, which Nobody does this. This is like this is a unique thing. So I'm going to take a nose of this because this is this is one of my top. Oh, it's it's so different. It, it really is. It's it's like it's like green apple, green like somebody cut up some green apples or some um, Macintosh apples and put them in a glass and squeezed them. Yeah. With uh, while you were while you were talking about this, I was. <clears throat> I was nosing it and uh, took a few, uh, snuck a few sips in there. It's just I get a lot more citrus from this. When you say apple, um, I, I I don't know if that influenced what I was thinking, um, but I was thinking more like uh, the nose on it to me smells like the smell in my yard right now, which is orange blossoms. Mm. And that's kind of what I'm smelling here, and maybe it's because of what's in my yard, but I doubt it. Um, it's definitely brighter uh, than the the Nick of Coffee, but far and away brighter. Um, it reminds me more of uh, of a Scotch style. Yeah, definitely. But the the flavors are brighter as well. It's I'm I'm getting more fruit notes. Yeah, and it, I would say this is more in the style of a. Um, uh, of a space side malt, so space. I mean, the regions of Scotland have become less and less synonymous with the flavor profiles they're they're sort of supposed to represent. Um, but in this case, space side is typically well known for uh, a bright, citrusy, um, fruity spirit, and I would say the Kushu fits perfectly within that. I mean, this is. Uh, a very unusual, even at 43%, like this is a very, very smooth, very easy drinking. Um, there's not a long finish to it, which is interesting because normally with a with a sherry finished whiskey, you get a lot of um, a long burn down the throat, and I'm not getting that. Um, it's it's got a 25 ppm peated malt, which is a lot. That's a that's a lot. I mean, you look at some of the um, really peaty whiskeys out there in Scotland, they have 25 ppm, and we'll get to that. Some of our the peaty one at the end. Um, and you get a ton of smoke. I'm almost getting no smoke out of this. Like, a, like it's, I'm really having to reach for any kind of peatiness in this whiskey. I would agree. And now, now I can't stop tasting apple. <laughs> and I blame you. And you know, that is a it, it, that's a better description than uh, than what I had. And I, I can I can smell it. I can taste it on the tongue a lot. There's like a, a, a caramel esque kind of sweetness on the finish to it. Absolutely. Um, so we start talking about caramel apple. That's good. Um, I don't know how well this pairs with the cigar. I'm kind of ignoring the cigar right now um, because I don't. I, I feel like they kind of butt heads a little bit. But um, I am enjoying that. That is, and this was the uh, Hakushu. So this is that is pretty damn tasty. And it's uh, it's not really that expensive. Um, I actually got this when I was visiting uh, San Francisco. Going to San Francisco. Did you go to uh, Cask? Uh, I actually went to Bevmo. I went to the Bevmo. Yeah. They had, they had it at Bevmo. Huh? They had it at Bevmo. I just walked into a Bevmo and I'm like, hey, I'm a Canadian. What kind of cheap booze do you have? And they had like seven different kinds of Japanese whiskey. And I'm like, heaven. Now, I should have been done the smart thing and I should have 
done two, three bottles in my in my uh, suitcase, but it was the first time I'd sort of brought back whiskey in my suitcase, and I was maybe concerned about breakage. Uh, but it was cheap. I think it was like in the fifty dollar range, which is absurdly cheap for what this is. I mean, I would pay seventy five, eighty bucks for this. No, no questions asked. Hmm. Yeah, that surprises me. I, you know, with the I've got two Bevmos that are pretty local to me, but, and I've never actually gone there looking for. Well, I shouldn't say never, but not recently. Um, so I'll, I'll have to check that out. So we were talking about um, the whiskey butting heads. Uh, I I definitely find that um, this is probably not the best combination. Um, I think the the uh, the Hakushu is a little too bright. It's a little too citrusy for the cigar, which is unfortunate. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to I'm trying to rack my brain to think about what I would pair this with. Let's just go with Cameroon because that's what we always do. Yeah, you know it's weird because like I think that's what's missing is you need you need that sort of crushed nuttiness to offset the fruit. Like the you know the the Fuente is just too delicate. I think to to go with this, it's not standing out enough. The citrusy is too bright. Yeah, I would I would agree with that with the experience that I'm having the 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 creamy texture, the creamy style of the cigar, and the bright, almost more astringent style of the whiskey, it, it doesn't, for me at least, it, it doesn't, it's oil and water right now. Yeah. That silence is me trying to get my cigar lit again. <laughs> yeah, and me not picking up the ball, sorry about that. I'm doing it again. So yeah, the, uh, that, I, I really do enjoy that though, and when you say 50 bucks, I mean that's, Fifty bucks is is a is a decent little nut for a, for a bottle, um, and that's kind of that's kind of where I live in that price range. I mean, I I don't think I've I've never spent more than seventy five bucks on a bottle of booze. Uh, I know I easily could, but I never have. Um, I, I can't. I'm trying to think of what's the most expensive thing I've ever bought, but you know, the most expensive thing I ever bought was probably. Uh, a Jameson, a bottle of Jameson um, Distillery Reserve when I was in mm -hmm. Ireland, which I, I can't remember. It was probably like 50 euro. Yeah. So what is that, like 80 bucks? Mm-hmm. At the time. At so, the time. At the time it was 80. I don't know what it is now. But. Anyway. So, yeah, I mean, I would say that this is um, this is an excellent whiskey. Um, again, we'll leave a little in the glass, but excellent whiskey, maybe not the best pairing in the world. Um yeah, uh, Cameroon would be good. I might even go crazy and do a um, San Andreas Maduro, uh, only because I think the sweet pepper might cut off nicely with that with that citrus. Like that sweet citrus might balance it, but then it might it might uh, it might make it really sour. So it's tough to say. I might have to experiment a little bit on my own. Do some do some yeah. pairing research for for, uh, for science. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know that's one thing that I've learned on this show is. If you, 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 you go to pair something and you think it's going to work really well and it sucks, and you're just like, dude, what was I thinking? Sometimes going with something that you have that you think there's absolutely no way that these two things are going to pair, like an IPA and a Connecticut Broadleaf, like there's no way that those two things are going to are going to pair well, and sometimes they do. That's part of the fun of it, though. So I think maybe what we'll do is uh, have another couple sips and then move on to the uh, to the next whiskey, which is the Yamazaki. Um, and we're kind of flip-flopping between you know, Beam Suntory and, uh, and Nika. Um, <clears throat> but in this case, we're sticking with... Uh, so we started out with a, a Nika. Um, the next two, the, the Hakushu and the Yamazaki, are both Beam Suntory. And then we'll finish up with, uh, with Chichibu. Uh, Chichibu is actually an independent distillery. Uh, but I'm getting ahead of myself, so I'm gonna have another sip because it it is very tasty. Um, this this is an excellent uh, spring summer scotch, I think, or whiskey, I should say. Yeah. Um, because it's so light, it's so delicate. I mean, I I would enjoy this in a hot day, where a lot of whiskeys I definitely wouldn't. Yeah, that's uh, that's actually a pretty good point because it is that it's got that bright, uh, that bright flavor profile, and it's 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 definitely not heavy. Um, <clears throat> and it, it's it could almost be too easy drinking, to be honest. Mm. I like to call that uh, that specific type of uh, booze in my in my book is it would be listed under dangerous <laughs> because you you have three or four of them and you're just you're just sitting there just hanging out and everything's fine you get up and you fall down and it is I mean it is forty three percent I mean normally yeah, uh, 
Yeah, it's no joke. I mean, most whiskey is going to be, and scotch is going to be 40% plus because uh, it has to be. Um, 43 is, uh, it's a heater, and, and like I said, it, it goes down easy. I could I could have two ounces of this and not even know it. Now, the listeners out there would know it because they'd be slurring my words, but um, <laughs> it's good. I mean, I would say that um, it lacks a lot of complexity for me. Um, you know, I would, I would drink, as a 12-year-old, this probably beats almost any 12-year-old scotch out there, in my opinion. There's a lot of 12-year-old scotches out there as an entry level. For me, the Hakushu would, if you're looking to sort of get into the scotch and, and whiskey world, uh, this is a great entry because um, I think anybody could drink this and enjoy it. Like, it's just, it's so delicate. It doesn't have that long finish. Uh, it's not going to blow you away. Yeah, as you were as you were describing it, I was thinking, yeah, this is a good, a good a gateway uh, Japanese whiskey. Um, it's definitely lighter, and I just I cheated. I, I went ahead and I took a sip of the uh, the Yamazaki, which I've had before. Um, that was one of the first ones that I've tried, and it's 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 much heavier, um, yeah. in in the sense of you know just just the mouth feel. It definitely coats your tongue, um, while the uh, I, I keep flipping back to the picture because I want to make sure I get the names right. Uh, the Hakushu is is is. Not like that at all. It's, it's got the, the finish is quick, uh, the flavors are bright. Uh, it's yeah, it's definitely easy sipping. And then when you when you start talking about the, you know comparing it to a twelve year old Scotch, and you know you're going to be around the same price range, uh, although you probably get a Glenlivet twelve or Glenfiddich twelve uh, cheaper. Um, but for that same type of price range, it performs pretty well. So we're, um, we're the two original people we're talking about, um, Masataka Takatsuru and, um, and Sinjiro Tori. Uh, Sinjiro Tori uh, founded Yamazaki, um, sort of centralish Japan. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's near a major city. Um, Mak- Mats- Mats- I'm, I'm terrible at the, the Japanese. Um, the, the second gentleman wanted to move the distillery to the coast or... Um, you know, someplace more akin to where Jap- our, um, Scottish distilleries are, which is um, outlying districts, um, mountainous districts. Um, Yamazaki Distillery uh, is near Yamazaki. Um, it is in the Vale of Yamazaki. Uh, it's right outside the capital of Japan, Kyoto. So uh, it's not in, 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 you know, you think about Scottish distilleries in the middle of nowhere. Um, this distillery is huge. Uh, believe it or not, it is actually the second largest distillery in the world. Mm-hmm. So um, people were asking us before the show, like, you know, Japanese whiskey is that, that big of a deal. Let me tell you how big of a deal it is. <laughs> they produce 7 million liters a year. Holy mother. That's 1.84 million gallons of whiskey. 1.84 million. That is a stupendous amount. I think by comparison, Glenfiddich, produces 2.5 million liters. So, I mean, it's huge. Um, wow. Bowmore, uh, pardon me, Lagavulin produces 2.25 million. Uh, Glen Farkless, which is, I mean, a huge, huge distillery, produces 3 million, which is only 792,000 gallons. So, I mean, it's it's stupid huge. Um, and it's only number two. So there's a there is a Scottish distillery that they opened um, that is bigger. So this is a big factor. This is the original distillery, opened in 1923 by Beam Suntory at that time only Suntory. It was the first Japanese commercial distillery. Um, the reason they opened it where they did again water supply, high humidity. So that means you you're losing less to the angel share. So there's less evaporation because of humidity. Um, great water supply. That's key to to whiskey distillery. Um, founded by Sin. Um, uh, the Yamazaki is blended by uh, Shinji uh, Fuku, and I apologize because I probably massacred his name. He's the chief distillery, chief um, blender at Centauri. Um, the Yamazaki 12 uh, was started in 1984, uh, and it was really the first seriously marketed Japanese whiskey in the world. So this is kind of the whiskey that broke Japanese whiskey into the market internationally. Uh, this guy, believe it or not, he and his team sampled between 20 and 25 thousand samples of whiskey a year. So wow. this guy is very, very serious about his whiskey. Um, it's got a it's got a cool packaging. I mean it, it's got a nice color to it. Um, it's forty percent ABV. I'm just gonna grab my glass here. 
You can see it's got a, a nice golden color to it. Uh, part of that is because it comes from ex uh, American oak bourbon casks, so you're going to get a lot, a lot of influence from that. Um, also Spanish sherry, so that you're going to get a little bit of reddening from that. Now here's where it gets really interesting: is they've introduced a third kind of wood. Now nobody else in the world does this. Japanese oak called Mizunara. Now what's special about Mizunara is Mizunara is very, very porous. Now the reason that Scotch distilleries use American oak and Japanese distilleries use American oak to age the spirit is because uh, American oak is very tight. It is not very porous. You can put spirit in it for a very, very long time uh, and it takes a very long time for the uh, wood to influence the spirit. Mizunara oak is very porous. You can put whiskey in Mizunara oak uh, for a very short period of time and get a ton of influence off of the oak. I'm just going to take a moment and remind listeners that we're listening to Sharing Our Pairings, Episode 25, Japanese Whiskey. That's right. We've done 25 episodes. Wow. You're listening to this live broadcast around the world on CigarFederation.com. Thanks very much for our podcast listeners. Um, getting back to it, so Mizunara Oak, uh, you can only put the whiskey in it for a very short period of time because it influences the whiskey a substantial amount, and they're the only ones, only ones in the world doing it right now. The... Uh I've cheated, and while you were talking, I was taking a few sips. <clears throat> and since you brought it up, I'm getting apple off of this one as well. Mm -hmm. But it's it's a it's a more autumn kind of apple, um, like more like an apple pie kind of apple, a, a, like a, a red apple, a dark, a darker, heavier apple flavor. Uh, it's not overpowering. Um, there's a, an, another another coating sweetness on the finish. Um, the the flavor to me is just it's more full. The experience is more full. Um, it's a step up from what we were just tasting. The the it's 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 got more complexity to it. It's got more depth of flavor to it. It's like we took the training wheels off when when we jumped into this one. At least that's my experience. But still very very smooth. I and I would say um, you know talking about the apple. Um, it's almost got an apple cider quality to it, like a, yeah. That's that's what that's a much better way to say it. That's what I meant, like a you know, that fall kind of you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Like like when you get an apple cider, you're getting um, less of the sweetness of the apple and more of that tart, sort of deep, complex apple flavor. And almost um, some of those mulling spices in there a little bit. Absolutely. Well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, like um like a little bit of um it's not pepper, but like you said, it's it's spicy, almost the cinnamon. Uh, influence and I think a lot of that is coming from that Miz Mizunara oak um, and I, I cheat because I've got other Mizunara oak influenced Japanese whiskey and I've come to associate uh, apple with Mizunara oak. Now you do get a lot of pear and um, strawberry fruit uh, and, and sort of a lot of delicate fruit from American oak but for me that bright appley deep apple that's that to me. That's Japanese Mizunara oak. That's I, I yeah. That's where I get it from. Yeah, and the way that you said it with that apple cider, and it's just it's more <clears throat> the flavors are just they're thicker. They're more syrupy to me, um, and I don't think syrupy is the right word. I'm thinking syrupy more of a texture as opposed to being overwhelming your palate. Mm -hmm. um, it's and I, I'm I'm remembering as I'm sipping this. I'm remembering the first time that I tried this, and the first ones that I had were was the the uh, Yamazaki 12 and uh, Hibiki 12, which we're not tasting Hibiki tonight. But, um, but we will be. Yeah, that's the one that I actually have, so you don't have to send me any of that. Um, the, uh, the, the flavor, it's just so fulfilling. It's so damn good that I don't really know how else to describe it. it and it's really unique. I mean, it, there's there, like you said, you're getting some of those things that you get from an American bourbon. You're getting some of those things that you get from a Scotch whiskey, but you take that and you add just a, another another niche to it, and it's it's a unique flavor, um, and it's unique in the sense that it's using that uh, the wood that I, I can't remember what it was called. Mizanara. Uh, Miz Mizanara oak. Thank you. Um, yeah, this I, I'm I'm reminded why I've I've gone through a couple of bottles of this. Uh, one of the things I forgot to mention about the Hakushu Distillery, and Andrew would probably kill me about this, is because uh, I talked about how it was set in the foot of the mountain. Um, 
the, the the distillery, no joke, is literally surrounded by a forest. So when you go into the uh, the um, boardroom of Hakushu and you look out the window, you're literally looking out to the top of a canopy of this enormous forest. And the whole dist because the sort of theme of that distillery is is very um, influenced from the fact of where it's located. So they try to kind of do that in the design of the of the distillery itself. So apparently. If you can go there, it's amazing. Like it's probably one of the better Japanese distilleries you can visit because it's just an amazing experience. Um, but back to the Yamazaki. So uh, very famously, I think last year, um, Jim Murray rated the Yamazaki 18 the best whiskey in the world. Now, we we kind of talked. We talk about this all the time. We talk about best, best in cigars, best in whiskey, best in scotch. It's very subjective. Uh, now that said, I think there's there's some aspect to me that Japanese whiskey needs to get its due and I think that uh, it is really it really doesn't get enough respect in the industry for what they're doing um, for some of the flavor profiles they're bringing and it's not that it's better than scotch whiskey it's to me it's it's uh, in the in the style of scotch whiskey but it just brings a different series of flavors that you're not going to get out of a scotch whiskey so to me a unique product that it would have alongside of a Scotch whiskey. Yeah, and that's <clears throat> that's a much more eloquent way of saying uh, the point that I was trying to make. That it's it's its own beast. Um, I mean, you can say it's like you say you can say it's got qualities that are, are similar to a couple of different things, but it's also got its own qualities. Um, and I, I remember when uh, I think you and I had talked about it when that was announced, and I don't even know who the guy is or what his prominence is or why his opinion matters, but uh, why does anybody's opinion matter, really? But uh, it, it didn't surprise me that <clears throat> something from some, a Japanese whiskey is, uh, has reached those heights. And, uh, and I think you're right. I mean, and it's something that I've noticed just from the last few days talking about we're going to do the show. People didn't really know what Japanese whiskey was. No. Nope. Um, and that's uh, that's that's a shame because it's 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 really fantastic stuff. And and like you said, I think it's got a really thick uh, mouthfeel to it. Um, mm -hmm. It's a lot more. Uh, I guess the way I would say it is more satisfying than the Hakushu. The Hakushu is good. It's delicate. It's tasty. Um, but if I'm looking for a more complex flavor experience, I'm reaching for the Yamazaki 12, or you know, if I'm lucky enough to have the Yamazaki 18, which I do not. Uh, it's very good. It's 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 just it's the next level up. You know, it's the, it's the deeper end of the pool. Um, one of the interesting facts, because we talked about their production, uh, Yamazaki features 24 pot stills. 24. To put that into context, Bowmore. Everyone's heard of Bowmore. They have two. <laughs> Lagavulin. Lagavulin has two pot stills and two wash stills. Len Farkless. Glenn Farkless, we talked about they produce 3 million gallons, or pardon me, uh, 792,000 gallons of spirit. They have three pot stills and three wash stills. <laughs> Yamazaki has 24. So you think about the range of spirit, the range of flavors that they can come up with with 24 different shaped stills, it's literally infinite. I mean, it's not infinite, but... It's a lot of combinations. I mean, you could spend an entire lifetime and never come up with every possible combination from, um, yeah. That's Now, that goes back to the fact that they're not sharing spirits, right? That's correct. So, yeah. um, in this case, Beam Suntory has to, re has to rely on the spirit that they've got from all their different, um, all their different uh, distilleries. Um, obviously, Yamazaki is their biggest distillery, and uh, with 24 pot stills, they can pretty much come up with it, whatever they want. So Nick and, and uh, Beam Suntory are not sharing spirit. Yamazaki is going to come up with stuff that um, Nick is not, and uh, Yamazaki is going to come up with stuff that, uh, that Nick is not, and that's just the way it is. One thing, and I will make a comment on the pairing. The pairing here is much better. Um, Absolutely. But it's, it's to me... It's the I'm getting the flavor on my tongue from the Yamazaki. I'm getting the the flavor through the retrohale on from my cigar. That's and they're they're kind of compartmentalized almost um, for me. But they they complement each other really well. The sweetness, that thick sweetness from the uh, 
the Yamazaki and the the mild baking spice that I'm getting on the retro hill from this uh, Casada 40th uh, Corona Classica is um, it pairs really really nicely, and I think that might be where I'm getting that whole idea of you've got the you know an apple an apple cider, but then you do you add that mulling spice. I think maybe the cigar here is that mulling spice uh, component that it really does pair uh, exceptionally well. Now, just for fun, before we blow our palates out with the uh, last whiskey of the evening, which is a, a peated whiskey, go back to the Nikka coffee malt and take a big nose of that. And, I mean, it's it's a vanilla bomb for me, which yeah, I wasn't I, getting before. I'm still getting that sour, uh, fresh-cut wood, but it's like a vanilla creme brulee underneath. Yep. Yeah, it's like, um, like yeah, it's uh, that burned um, yeah. vanilla quality, the... Um, yeah, I was not. You're right. I was not getting that at all before. Now wow. I am. Now when you you were talking about the Hakusha, you said that you picked up some orange blossom, and I'm actually getting a huge uh, orangey, like an orange rind from it now. Yeah, it's still there. It's still there. It's almost taken on for me, almost like a <clears throat> a, a bit more of a lime. Type citrus, oh, yeah. but yeah, it's it's funny, man. Like, we're not doing this in an optimal environment. No, but uh, it, it, that's just how we roll. But it's uh, how we roll here on sharing our pairings. It's the, our show. It's our rules. But the difference is, it really is amazing. It really is. It really is amazing. That's uh, go back and sip them. I want to. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not going to. And, and luckily, these little bottles have caps on them, yep. so I can uh, I can check these out a bit more later. But who knows? I mean, it's kind of like my Friday night, so it might get weird. We're going to get weird here on Sharing Our Parents. So we're going on to our last whiskey of the evening, last but not least. This is Chichibu. And I'm not going to tell you how old this is. Uh, I'm going to let us taste it and enjoy it first, then you can... Uh, toss out just, you know, what your guesstimate is. Um, Chichibu uh, has two pot stills, so they're not as big as the other distilleries. Um, uh, boy, I had the, um, that's that's awkward because I had the, uh, oh, uh, Ichiro Akudu, sorry, is the founder of the uh, distillery, so that's why his name is on all the bottles. Um, in this case, Ichiro's malt, Chichibu. Uh, there's a story behind that. Uh, his grandfather was the own, uh, founder of uh, Hinyu Distillery, which is unfortunately closed, uh, as distilleries do over time. So Chichibu actually has all of his old casks. So this is like really old spirit. And um, wow. um, Ichiro takes that spirit and he incorporates it into a lot of the whiskeys they make. Now, it's not in this particular whiskey, and we'll talk about why. Um, but he actually worked for Beam Suntory before founding his own distillery. And um, his thing, so we talked about how the other distillers are kind of pushing the envelope for whiskey distilling. He went the other way. He is going for 100% Japanese, 100% all the way. So I mean like 100% Japanese barley, 100% Japanese wood, 100% Japanese technique, um, all the way from barley to barrel, Everything that he does is is traditionally Japanese. Um, now Chichibu isn't on the uh, outskirts of Japan. It's about a two-hour train ride from Tokyo, so it's in a bit of an industrial area, a little bit outside of an industrial area. Uh, but the the like I said, the um, drink itself gets its name from um, Ichiro. Um, not going to talk about the age just yet, but only 5,000 bottles of this were produced. This puppy is a heater. It is bottled at cask strength. 50.5%. That surprises me. Because it is really, really smooth. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's it's a little bit more warm. And Ooh. if uh, warm is my term for, you know, that little burn you get in your throat. Yep. Or if uh, <clears throat> my wife and I are making cocktails or something and I make her one, she'll be like, ooh, that's a little warm. Meaning I, put, I poured a little heavy-handed uh, when I was making it. Um... That surprises me that it's it's that uh, that the alcohol content is that high. It is really really smooth. Um, the flavors are big time. I mean, big 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 peaty notes in there. Yep. 
I mean, big time. It's big time. really, really strong. It's I, it's not on it's not on par with like a Lefroy, um, but it's it's stepping in that direction. And maybe that's just by comparison to what we've had here. And if I tasted a Lefroy right now, I would say no way, not even close uh, as Petey. But it's definitely stepping in that direction for me. So I'm going to take this opportunity to answer a question from Trip Waldrop. Trip, we really appreciate you posting a question. You're the first one to post a question. Uh, he said that all of the Japanese whiskeys he's had are closer to a Highland Space Side style, and I think we would um, echo that in some of the tastings we've done tonight. Is that they are um, they are very Space Side esque in that they're delicate and they're fruity. And he wants to know if there's any Japanese whiskeys that are closer to an Islay style. Well, there is. Um, now, we, we kind of don't have an example tonight. Uh, we will in their Japanese whiskey 2.0, but I'll save that. Hakushu does a peated whiskey uh, that is much more peated and Ile style. The Chichibu tonight is absolutely uh, uh, Ile style. This is um, this would absolutely fit right into the, the Lagavulin, Lafroig, where uh, you know they're obviously on the heavy, heavier end of this, this spectrum. Um, uh, but this is definitely within that that category, and this is if you like the peatier whiskeys, uh, maybe you're in a in a Talisker mood, which is a little bit smoky, and you want to step up to peat. Chichibu is a great way to get your peat training wheels on because it's got that peat, but it, it's not going to blow you away. It's like Rob was saying, it's got a ton of flavor complexity. So um, I think for me, Chichibu would be a, a great PD training wheel one to go. Um, I just cheated and I looked at the photo. And I don't. You didn't uh, cover up the age Damn. of this. And when you when you were quiet about it, I thought you were going to be in the other direction of how old it is. I'll let you break the uh, break the story because I, I'll, I know the bulk of our listeners are, are listening on the podcast, um, and I don't want to spoil it. Um, I will say that the flavor that I'm getting from this, and I'm going to look back at the photo here of the chichibu, which is fun to say. Um, it's blowing the cigar out a little bit. Absolutely. This is going to be, I would want something um, maybe not so spicy, but with a bit more sweetness to it. At least in my brain, that's how I'm thinking about it. But it probably, I think the, the way to go would be a Cameroon wrapper. <laughs> well, you know, I would say um, Cameroon would be good, but I might even go heavier. I might go with Albano wrapper or yeah, even I've, the, uh, the I, San Andreas. I've, I was making a joke, but okay. that's going to be an ongoing joke. It's just uh, every week we have to talk about Cameroon, and Cameroon we have to happens. never, ever pair it. Just never do it. We'll always talk about it and never actually do it. 2015 is going to be the year of the Cameroon rappers you watch. Yeah, that's there it is. It's the year of the Cameroon. It's got to be the year of something. Um, so I'm actually just going to put the cigar down. Um, they are uh, both very good in their own, um, but the, the, the flavors from, uh, from the Chichibu here which, again, is really fun to say, um, are blowing it out. So I'm just going to put the cigar down. I'm not going to talk about the pairing at all. But it is uh, it, it's a heater, man. Yeah. That's for sure. And I'm stunned so, at how old it is. I'm stunned. So before you, before you cheated, cheetah, before you cheated, what would, I mean, you know, it's obviously influenced now, but what would you have guessed the age to be at? Well, uh, when... When someone asks that, like, oh, how old do you think it is? To me, or, or something along those lines, like, how much do you think it is? That either means it's really expensive or it's really cheap. And in this instance, I figured it was, well, by saying that, it's probably really old. Um, so that probably influenced my thoughts more so than anything else. But with how smooth it is, I was thinking 14, yep. 15, 16 year. <laughs> And and I mean I'm a, I'm a like I said I'm a I'm a whiskey scotch slut. Um, when I first tasted this, I would have sworn that this is absolutely 14 years, maybe 15, um, not as old as 17 because I'd feel like it had it'd have to have more flavor complexity. But if you had told me it was a 12, I would have said, "Holy crap! Like wow, this is a 12. This is a three-year-old whiskey, <laughs> three years old. It was uh, um, bottled. Uh, pardon me." Uh, distilled in 2009, bottled in 2012. The distillery's only been open since 2008. And the reason I wanted to bring this last is because it is peated, but also because uh, there is a growing contingent of snobs out there. I'm, I'm a pretty snobby guy when it comes to scotch, but I like stuff that tastes good. 
And I could give a crap whether it's an age statement whiskey. Excuse me. I could give a crap whether it's an age statement whiskey. I could give a crap whether it's a five-year-old whiskey. Um, there's some great younger whiskeys out there. All I care about is how it tastes. Now, for me, I would put this up against any other Isley in my in my collection. Now, I've got a lot of Lagavulin Mafroig that I really enjoy. That's much older. Obviously, has a ton more flavor complexity. But this is really interesting. This is really really tasty. I would never have believed it was three years until I looked at the bottle. No way. Yeah, I. Uh, <clears throat> as soon as you brought it up, I looked, and usually the the age is kind of in the lower half of the bottle if it's not, um, in, or the lower half of the label, I should say, uh, depending on where the label's put on the bottle. Um, but this is it's right there, distilled in in two thousand nine and bottled in two thousand twelve. This is the kind of of whiskey that. I would love to have in rotation on my bar because it fills that niche just like you were saying. If you want if you're going with something smoky, you know, like a Talisker or uh, I would even put like an Oban in something Oban. like that. Yeah. Oban's a nice smoky one. And I've got a nice bottle of Oban fourteen that I really enjoy. But sometimes I want that little extra peat. And the only other thing that I have in in my bar right now is uh uh Lefroy, uh Ten year, I think, or whatever the the, the regular standard Lafroig is, yeah. and that's just too far. In in that, uh, it's a too far, too big of a step in that direction. It's this, too much, man. It's too much. <laughs> this just fits a really nice niche, niche, whatever. I say niche. I think it's niche, but um, that I would love to have. But again, you said that what five hundred bottles of this are made, something like that. Five thousand bottles. Oh, yeah. five thousand. It still sounds like something that's never going to make its way into my bar. But uh, if if uh, if I were to come across this, what what would this what would this bottle cost? Do you have any idea? You know what? Let me um, let me look it up because I don't even know. Um, I threw you under the bus. The one thing you weren't I asked you the one question you weren't prepared for. Unbelievable! This guy, I tell you. But it's uh, uh, it, I, I don't think it's that much. It's a compliment though, because this is really really good, and it's it's unique in that sense that it's got some smoky, but it's also got that peat, and it's not going to blow you out. I mean, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna sit down and have two or three of these, but it's I'm gonna have one and put a nice generous pour and maybe watching a movie or watching some episodes of uh, House of Cards because I always feel like I need to drink when I'm watching that show. Hell yeah! And same with Downton Abbey because they always they're always pouring out of their really nice crystal cut decanters and I feel like I should be doing that too. I think this this poppy is going to run you because of the limited quantity because this distillery is not very old. It's probably going to run you about 125 bucks. Now that that is a that is a few bucks um, because you can probably pick up a Talisker for 80 or 90 bucks. I picked it up because it's unique. Um, I don't expect our listeners to go out there and drop 125 bucks on a bottle of Chichibu. I would because uh, I'm not going to get anything like this ever again. I mean, maybe Chichibu is going to release something like this in a couple of years again, and you know, I'm sure that the flavor complexity is just going to be to the next level, and I'm going to buy it. And, and if it's 150 bucks or 160 bucks, I'm going to spend my money like I hate it, and I'm going to buy it. Um, <laughs> spend it like you hate it, buddy. Um, but it's unique. I mean, like you said, it fills it fills that niche between Oban 14 and the next level up. There, you know, there's it's really tough to ease into the heavier PDN. Um, but if you are a whiskey or scotch aficionado and you like peat, um, I would I would definitely recommend picking this up. I mean, this to me, this is just a uh, it's just an unbelievable whiskey for three years. I mean, I can't wait for to see what they come out with for five years and seven years. It's just it's gonna win. Like Jim Murray's gonna be just gonna be blown his nut when he gets the next Chichibu because <laughs> I think this is gonna be the next big thing. Yeah, this is. Uh, I'm, I'm looking here, and, I'm, and while you're talking, I, I'm looking. Where can I buy this? And of course, the only places. That, the first thing that came up was WineSearch.com, and it's available in Portugal, and London, and Switzerland, and Australian eBay. Um, but uh, it, Portugal, it's uh, $126 a bottle, but it's probably going to cost me 70 bucks in shipping. Um, yeah. This is the kind of thing, and I don't, I've never spent that much on a bottle, um, <clears throat> but if I'm looking at this costing me the same as a bottle of Johnny Walker Blue Label, that's, it's not even a choice yeah. for me to go with something like this, because like you said, it's unique, it's, uh, it's the kind of thing you, you hide in the back of your bar when people come over because you don't want them to drink it, 
and uh, you, you bring it out when your good friends come over. Um, but yeah, this is, it's really unique, man. And uh, thank you for sharing it with me. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you a story, and you're going to call me a bastard about this uh, before we get into our last question from Jason Myers. Thanks, Jason, for posting a question. So I was at the first Japanese whiskey tasting. Uh, I had this. Completely blew me away. Like, that was, you know, to me, um, a lot of the Yamazaki I already owned. Uh, Kushu was fantastic. I was obviously going to pick that up. I picked up, like, three different Nikas, which we'll do in our Japanese whiskey 2.0 or 3.0. And I was there with my girlfriend, uh, she likes whiskey. She she's not a fan of the Scotch because I think she finds that uh, it's too heavy. It it just blows her palate out. But she loves whiskey, um, and she really enjoyed the Japanese whiskey, and she really enjoyed the Chichibu, which is you know to me weird because peated whiskey drives her from the room. Like just the smell of pouring in the glass drives her from the room. So uh, Andrew likes to do um, giveaways, bottle giveaways, and I said, listen, I gotta have this bottle of Chichibu, and he said, I'm sorry, man that's my last bottle. Like I opened my last bottle and I poured it to share it with you guys. And I said, you know what? You're a bastard because <laughs> I would buy this. And like, I appreciate you sharing it with all of us, but I want to own this. And he's like, well, put your name in the hat. I mean, you know, maybe you'll, uh, maybe you'll I win it. I don't want to hear the rest of the story. Oh no, it's great. It's great. <laughs> uh, so, um, and we can run as long as we want cause it's our show. We could do whatever we want. I might even yeah. pour myself a little bit more. Let's, Fair enough. Let's just be honest. It's so good. I'm, I might top you up when I bring it down to New Orleans. I might bring you another refresher. So This is unreal, man. So uh, my girlfriend uh, didn't want to be on the, 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 the list, the mailing list, right? Because she, you know, she's not going to buy whiskey. She's going to let me buy whiskey, and she's going to have some of the whiskey for me. Um, but the guys at the table were giving a hard time, which was kind of funny. They said, well, you know, who bought, who bought the ticket? Did you buy the ticket? And she's like, "Well, no." You know, John, John bought the ticket. And they said, "Well, come on, you gotta, you gotta put your name in the hat." I mean, you, you owe it to them to put your name in the hat. So they were like really giving the gears, and I actually started to feel a little uncomfortable. I was like, "Come on, guys!" Like she doesn't want to fill out the thing. Don't. Like I don't. I love to win, but I'm, you know, come on. Yeah. She ends up putting her name in the hat. She wins the bottle. So, this Chichibu, I did not buy this. I was a, a lucky bastard. I was lucky enough to win this at one of the uh, Kensington Newmont Market tastings, and I'm happy to share it with you. Uh, it's amazing. I, I would buy this. I did not have to buy this because I am a bastard. Yeah, you didn't even win it. You won it by proxy. That's, uh, mm -hmm. that's, that's kind of awesome. Um, that's the kind of thing that my wife would do, though, although she would be the first person to fill out the thing because uh, maybe she'd milk it a little bit just to get just to, to rile people up, but she would win, and then and then she wouldn't share it with me. You know, she'd give me a hard time, and she'd pour a glass and really enjoy it and make a big deal out of it. Then, of course, she'd share it, but uh, she likes to give me a hard time. But yeah, I would uh, absolutely, man. Well, that that's a that's a great story. That's and I I know that I know for a fact that you would buy this. Mm -hmm. um, if uh, if I walked into um, you know a, a really nice uh, liquor store or you know whatever establishment that would have something like this. And they had they had one or two bottles. I'd probably buy them both, and I wouldn't even think twice about it. And Absolutely. I'd, I'd have to uh, do. I'd have some uh, some splaining to do when I got home. But some splaining. But that's all right. I'll uh, I'll give the dog a bath or I'll mow the lawn. Oh Jesus! I've got a gigantic bee in here. Holy! Get stung by bees. No, get out! Out, son. Go! Holy! I'll, I'm gonna mute myself and get this thing out of here. Roger that. So while you're muting yourself, I'm going to roll right into the last question of the night from uh, Jason Myers. Again, Jason, thanks so much for asking your question. Um, podcast listeners out there, as uh, Rob fiercely swats the bee as their endangered species tries to kill it, uh, we appreciate you guys listening. If you guys want to ask questions before the show, we usually have our, our show page up a um, few days in advance, four or five days. Uh, if you guys have questions for the show, definitely ask them. We appreciate you guys uh, listening. We know you guys are out there. Are tons and tons of downloads and listens, either through uh, iTunes or from the uh, Cigar Federation app, which I know you've downloaded because we've been hammering it all night. Um, at any rate, Jason Myers asks, the range of Japanese whiskey you are having tonight is around 70 bucks US dollar for a bottle. And that's about right. I mean, they, <clears throat> most, most whiskeys in general will range from... Uh, or at least uh, scotches, pardon me, will range from $50 plus. Japanese whiskey is 
is expensive because they're 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 uh, bringing it over from Japan. It's not cheap. His question is, do you think these whiskeys are worth the money compared to many of the Scotch offerings also available at this price point? And I like this question. This is a really good question for me. So I think we're both going to have a chance to answer this. For me, I spend money like I hate it when it comes to whiskey and cigars. Uh, Rob knows this. Logan knows this. Logan loves to give me the gears about this because I am obsessive. When I pick up a, a new hobby, I go crazy. Um, the answer for, for me is yes. The reason is because, and we talked about this throughout the show, it is unique. Every single bottle of Japanese whiskey is unique. It gives you something, and by the way, Japanese whiskey is spelled without an E because they're emulating Scottish, so just so you guys know. Bourbon is spelled with an E when whiskey. Japanese whiskey, Scottish whiskey is spelled without the E. Um, but they're giving you a product that you cannot buy elsewhere. It is unique. You're not going to get this in a Japanese or a Scotch whiskey. I love Scotch whiskey. I have a lot of Scotch whiskey. I also have now an ever-growing collection of Japanese whiskey. And the reason for that is because they're delicious and they're unique, and um, it is worth it to me. Whether it's worth it to you, you have to examine your budget. 70 bucks is a lot of money. 80 bucks is a lot of money. 100 bucks is a lot of money to spend on a bottle of whiskey. So, uh, Rob, what's your take? Um, <clears throat> I, I, you know, it's funny when you were talking about you like to spend money like you hate it. I, uh, I did a quick Google search to find that Glenlivet that you and I almost polished the bottle off at yeah, our uh, at our hotel last year. The uh, the Glenlivet Madura, and there's actually two different versions now. Mm -hmm. and I don't. I don't know if there was before, but there's the Nadura and then there's the Nadura 16 year. Oh yeah. Which uh, that that must be a new one. Yeah. And it's it's funny looking at it. They've got uh, apples and vanilla and uh, some cinnamon sticks there, so that actually seems like it'd be right up our alley. But um, absolutely, I think it's worth it. Um, but again, like you said, you have to examine your budget. You got to. I mean, I'm not going to overextend. Just to buy a you know a bottle of of you know whatever um, if if I came across a, this a, a bottle of this of Ichiro's malt repeated uh, of course I'm going to buy a bottle of it as long as I can my budget can stomach it um, but uh, I don't and, and I and you and I are actually in a little bit of a, a, a different a different set of scenarios there because I don't I don't really prioritize my budget for um, for things like this. I'll pick up some stuff if I like it, but I don't. Uh, I don't really go out on a limb with some of this stuff. But having tasted it, absolutely, I would pick it up. If I saw something like this that was about a hundred bucks and I had never tried it before, yeah, I'm not going to take that plunge. But um, you know, for I found a bottle of Hibiki. They had it at Costco of all places. Um, for it was fifty bucks at Costco, and I think seventy-five, maybe eighty at uh, Bevmo. And absolutely, I saw that, and I bought two. I didn't just buy one; I bought two because I had tasted it before, and I, I really liked the profile of it. It's it's unique, and I do like having a uh, I like having my bar with uh, different things. I don't like to have a lot of bottles of the same thing, even though I just said I bought two bottles when I was there. But you know, I'll put I'll have one bottle at the bar. I'll stick one in the back because I know that I'm going to enjoy it. I know that I'm going to go through it eventually, uh, and that way I've got another one in reserve. Um, it, are they worth the money? Is anything worth the money? I mean, you could ask that question about anything. Um, it's for me. I, I like to try different things. Um, I'm more inclined, while at the bar, to get a glass of something that I've never had before. And if it's twenty bucks a pour or something, sure, I'll give it a shot because it's fun. I like yeah. doing that. Absolutely. Um, so I, I, I guess for me, I'm more inclined to 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 do a tasting or something like that as opposed to investing in the bottle unless it's something that I've tried. And I would I would echo the sentiment. Um, Jason, one of the things, and certainly for our listeners out there, don't be afraid to ask your local liquor store or your local, um, you know, whoever you, you go to. If some of the smaller places might actually have an open bottle of this. Don't be afraid to ask. Say, hey, you know, I'm not sure whether I want to buy this. Do you have an open bottle? Can you pour me a little bit? There's a, like, I can go into pretty much any of my local stores here and say, hey, I haven't tried this. Would you mind pouring me a little bit to try out? Now, you know, they might say no, and, you know, that's just the way it goes. 
but a lot of places do have open bottles for samples. A lot of places have um, whiskey tastings or scotch tastings. And for me, a scotch tasting might cost 35 or 45 bucks, but it's worth every penny because I, I'm, I'm getting to try thousands of dollars worth of whiskeys on their dime. And they're happy to do it because they know at the end of the night, I'm going to walk out of there with a bottle. I'm a whiskey slut. I'm coming out of there with a bottle. It's happening. So my advice to you, Jason, uh, if you have a, a fairly decent scotch collection already, if you if you have a lot of scotches you enjoy, uh, absolutely pick up a Japanese whiskey. You can't go wrong. Um, if you're unsure, uh, ask your local liquor store. See if they will hook you up with a taste or see if there's a local uh, tasting going on in your area. You never know. There's a, there's a lot of events going on all the time. Yeah, or and, and another thing, and that's one thing that, uh, that I've been able to do is find a, a local bar that's got um, you know, a fair uh, collection of whiskeys, and that, that's popular oh, yeah. nowadays. It's popular nowadays to have a whiskey bar um, with you know, a bunch of different bourbons, scotch, Japanese whiskey, uh, you know, Irish whiskey, and all that. And you know, get to, get to know a bartender, and like that's that's kind of the way that I actually ended up tasting uh, Japanese uh, whiskey to begin with. And one thing that we like to do, um, especially with spring and summer rolls around, because we've got a lot of friends that have uh, similar tastes uh, to us as far as uh, alcohol is concerned. We like to have, do like a little tasting, have people come over and you have to, everybody bring something to eat and everybody bring uh, a bottle or two and, and you can kind of, everybody pass it around the room and you can sample different things and uh, we've done that a few different times too and you can find some, uh, some interesting stuff that way. I think um, <clears throat> one of the things that we haven't really touched on for this particular pairing for the Chichibu is this would be absolutely outstanding with some really aged cheese. Oh yeah. Um, smoked Gruyere, Brie, um, this would be deadly. Yeah. Uh, so uh, maybe before we wrap it up here, we can talk about our favorite pairing. My favorite whiskey of the night is is the Chichibu, no question. Mm -hmm. I love the Yam Yamazaki for what it is. I love the Hakushu. I love the Nikka. Um, for me, I think uh, number one pairing has to be the Yamazaki 12 because of the flavor complexity. Number two uh, has to be the Nikka coffee malt. Yeah, I would uh, I would agree with you. Um, the pairing that worked out the best for me was the uh, was the Yamazaki. Um, again, for those same reasons, it had that that heavier uh, that heavier flavor to it that that could stand up to my cigar. And I was smoking a stronger cigar uh, flavor wise and I think strength wise uh, than you were. Um, so I, I needed a little bit of extra to it. Um, and the uh, the what was the second one that we had was the Hakushu. Hakushu. Uh, the pairing there was nice as well. It wasn't great. Um, I have to go back and watch again to, <laughs> to see what my exact comments were, but um, it was good. It wasn't great. The, the first pairing didn't really work for me, and the last pairing didn't really work, uh, but I will say without a doubt that uh, Chichibu was the best one of the night, um, and I'm going to be... I'm, I'm on a mission now to find that. Find it. Well, when I come down to New Orleans, you know I'm going to bring a, a full little mini bottle of that because uh, I love to share. Um, you know, we like to drink whiskey together. You, you commented a few shows ago that if we lived in the same city, we'd probably be going out a couple times a week, having some beers, having some whiskey. And there's no question because I think for me, part of the enjoyment of, of whiskey and, and certainly cigars is uh, enjoying them with other people and talking about your experience and, and just shooting the shit. Um, I really enjoyed that. That's That's a big part of the experience for me. Yeah, I, I'm I'm a big believer that if you lived closer, we'd be uh, we'd be fat. So fat. <laughs> just just like 200 pounds. Yeah, yeah. It would yeah. Uh, it it, uh, it would be kind of awesome though. Fat and single. <laughs> <laughs> You're too fat. Eat some vegetables. Yeah. Right. Um, on that note, uh, we'll wrap it up here because uh, we've we've had a pretty good show tonight. Um, Thanks, everyone, who uh, stuck with us this entire show. I mean, this is a pretty long show for us. Um, but I think Japanese whiskey kind of needed its due, and we'll definitely be doing a revival of this. I've got uh, an absolute ton of more uh, aged whiskey, which uh, some of the stuff I've got, some 21-year-old whiskey from Japan is going to blow you away. Uh, and we'll, we'll go back to that. We kind of needed a break. We've been doing a lot of beer shows. We've really enjoyed doing the um, Jew Estate Smoking Monk series, and we'll be back again on Wednesday 
Wednesday, April the 1st, which is uh, not an April Fool's joke, we'll be finishing up our series with the Belgian Triple. Uh, I'm kind of looking forward to that show partially because I think we've done a lot of beer shows and we need to, to switch things up. We'll be following the Smoking Monk series with the Dram Cigar pairings, which is going to be a series of whiskeys. So we're going to start with the Space Sides, uh, move up into the uh, heavier whiskeys and kind of kind of go along that route, which is going to be really interesting, I think. And I've sent you a bunch of samples uh, of that. So we've got a lot of whiskey. We're going to get pretty uh, fucked up. <laughs> uh, so look for that in a couple weeks. So definitely tune in next Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, we're going to have back-to-back sharing our pairing episodes. Belgian Triple. And uh, for you podcast listeners, because I appreciate you guys. There's tons of you guys out there. I'm going to have a special giveaway out of my yeah. pocket. Uh, I'm going to be giving away uh, a bunch of five-pack samples, four-pack samples of the uh, Smoking Monk. If you haven't already checked it out, there's like we we talked about every sh- every show. There's um, five-pack samples for like 29 bucks, which is crazy cheap. But as a podcast listener, you have a chance to win a couple of giveaways. I'm going to figure out how many I have left so I can figure out how many I'm going to give away in the show. But it's only going to be available for podcast listeners. Now, I'm going to do that in a very sneaky way to make because I know we got some, some super weasel power guys out there who want to win. Uh, if they want to win, they're going to have to listen to the podcast. That's the only way to win. We'll have some instructions on that next week. Uh, do you have any closing thoughts on our whiskey show today, Rob? Um, you know, it's... Uh it was it was fun. I, I it was nice, like you said, to get a break from the beer. Um, not that I don't like beer. I love beer. Um, but uh, five shows in a row when we're going every other week, that's a lot. And I know we've got uh, there's four or there's three different Dram cigars available now. The fourth one I think is on its way. Um, so we might uh, we might we might split those up. Maybe we'll see. Um, just to keep it fresh, as opposed to focusing too much on whiskey or too much on beer. Um, and try to learn from uh, what we did with the with the Smoky Monk. So the shows those shows are a lot of fun, but it was just it it, it got a little uh, repetitive, I think, for me to do them all in order. Maybe mix them up, and maybe we do a wine pairing show and get get weird in the middle there or something. Oh, yeah. there's, just, there's so many other things that we can uh, that we can play around with. Um, but um, so if you're going to do some giveaways next week for the podcast listeners, maybe I'll jump in and do uh, a giveaway or two for the live viewers. There you have it. It, it won't yeah. be uh, it won't be smoking monks. I don't have any left, but <laughs> 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 it'll be uh, it'll be something. Uh, it might be. Who knows? I, I'll have to look and see what I've got left. So get your weasel on next week, Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thanks very much, guys, for tuning in. And as we always say on all our shows, we want you to drink better and drink less. Thanks very much for tuning in. <laughs>